Okay, so I want you guys to get out this sheet. What we're going to talk about is, let's go back in time. Are you ready? Let's go back in time to, we're going to watch the last four minutes of that video after, but let's go back to the actual war. So 18, or 1917 to 1918, April to November. That's 18 months in American history. A lot of stuff happens in that 18 months. So the first thing that has to happen Here's a word for you, mobilization. What does mobili mobilization mean? It means what? Getting the troops moving. So we have to mobilize the troops very quickly over to Europe. Oh, yes. You took my paper. Oh, I didn't mean to. Wait, can I just do that with the um... Thank you. Yeah, it's very similar stuff. You're gonna see a lot of similarities even. So what are we going over there for? Unrestricted submarine warfare, right? Russians drop out of the war, and Zimmerman telegram, we declare war on Germany and the Central Powers. What are we going to do at home to support the war? Wait, let me ask this question today. What would we do today, heaven forbid, if World War III happened and we needed 10 million troops immediately? I'd probably cry. What would we have to do? Two things, right? One would be a peacetime draft, or a wartime draft. That's called the Selective Service Act on your sheet. That was enacted for the second time since the Civil War. It drafted, it drafted, what's it say for the ages for this one? Did anyone look that up, Selective Service? What's the ages that it drafted, Emma? Do you have that down? Yeah, 21 to 30. 21 to 30. And then later on. Later on, 18 to 45, because they needed more. It would be 18 now. Are there exceptions? Sure there are. Obviously, there's physical and mental health exceptions. What other exceptions are there? Uh, what if you're a sole provider on a family farm? What if you're going to med school or getting your teaching certificate? I'm pretty sure they can't, like, take uh, single child still. So. Yeah, they, they, they would go, I mean, maybe eventually, but not initially. So listen to this, folks. The Selective Service Act during World War I is, is something. What else? What would factories do? What would happen down the street in Tessie? Do you think the federal government would tell Tessie what to make because the war was going on? Yes. What about auto manufacturers? Would they tell Ford Motor Companies to, start, to stop making certain cars and to start making military vehicles? Maybe. Do you see how a war can be economically beneficial because it stimulates the economy and grows jobs? You understand that? Like, what would happen in a place like Lockheed Martin? My dad works there. Yeah, what would happen? He'd probably get a raise. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, happy. they'd be mass hiring, right? Because they would he'd need happy, yeah. much more. Like, World War III would be in Lockheed Martin's best interest. Terrible to say that. I'm putting that on tape. But, I mean, I'm just saying, financially, nobody wants World War III. Uh, in World War I, or the Great, Great War, what Wilson did was he hired these four guys. You should recognize some of these names. Is Taft Road named after William Hill? William Howard Taft, yeah, probably. I'm not 100% sure of that. He's uh, president, right? Guys, William Howard Taft was a past president. Bernard Baruch run the, ran the War Industries Board. Herbert Hoover took care of food rationing. And he would be a future president. And then Harry Garfield is going to talk about fuel and conservation of resources. So do you guys understand, if we were ever in a full-scale war, we might have to ration things so that the troops had items. I don't know if our society is capable of that because we're such mass consumers. Would we be capable of being told that we can only buy a certain amount that stamps of certain items? I don't know, Americans might have a hard time. But if we're all rallied around a cause, right, then maybe we would make sacrifices. Do you understand that? So what you see is Wilson's getting all hands on deck to support the war effort. Also, to make money for the government, they're going to sell bonds. What's a bond? What's a bond? It's a certificate. A war bond. Yeah, what's a bond? You give the government money, and you can't cash it out without a harsh penalty early. But say in 10 years, you can get 20% more. So it's a good, it's called forced savings. Do you understand that? So let's say somebody, you buy a bond, Jamie, $500. It'll be worth $600, but you can't cash it out until 2032. Now, what, why would you do that? Because you're supporting the war effort. So what did they do to get people to buy bonds? They called them liberty bonds, like patriotic. 
Remember, George Creel's on that list. A lot of propaganda promoting the war. Music, movies, war bonds. Yes. I remember watching a video on TikTok yesterday. I sometimes get on history TikTok, and uh, people sent Queen Elizabeth bonds for her wedding in 1947. Oh, wow. Did like she ever British cash them out? Or, not yeah. American bonds, obviously. Yeah. It, it's a win win for the government. Like, think about what bonds are. Uh, the one thing that I will say, and they grew victory gardens, they called them. They wanted all Americans to grow a garden because then you could self-sustain food, you know, so that there'd be more, you'd be le eating less food to send to the troops. You guys follow me with all this? You understand all these sacrifices? There would be times to save energy, to like save oil, that we would like have like blackouts where everyone would have to turn off like any kind of power and things like that. Uh, it was a time of sacrifice and, and people were on board because of the propaganda because this wasn't a war like Pearl Harbor and Adolf Hitler. We had to get Americans on board. Were there dissenters? Yes. And what happened, it's on your sheet. Civil liberties, a lot of people felt like were under attack, like the First Amendment. And, and especially when Congress passed the Sedition and Espionage Acts, which basically did what if you were caught going against the US government's war effort? They put you where? in jail. What about if you just said like, like think about today, think about, I don't, you know, the last five years, how much trash you've seen people talk about Trump or Biden, like one way or the other. And think about if this was wartime and we adhered to the policies of World War I, those people would be put in jail. Those people would be put in jail. We'd be putting everybody in jail now. Uh, obviously, times have changed. The most notable example that's on your sheet is Schenck versus the U.S. That's a Supreme Court case, and I need to teach you that right now. Charles Schenck urged Americans to burn their draft cards. When you got drafted, you used to get a card. Now it's online. You all realize when you turn 18, you got to register for the Selective Service within six months you get arrested, right? What? You all have to register when you turn 18. You'll get notice you'll register for the Selective Service. What's the Selective Service? Well, that means we have a volunteer army right now, a volunteer military. The Selective Service is so that we can mobilize quickly if we ever need to draft. So everybody that turns 18 in this country registers for the Selective Service, which means that they're in the system to get drafted if that ever came to that. There hasn't been a draft since Vietnam. Are you? And that was unpopular. I, I probably aged out soon. That's what I was going to say. And as a public school teacher, I think I'd be exempt. I had teachers in school, male teachers, who dodged the Vietnam draft, and that's why they became a teacher, because that was one of the exemptions. So I had a few high school teachers that were like, yeah, I didn't want to fight in Vietnam, that's why I became a teacher, which is a really crappy reason to be a teacher. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons to be a teacher. Avoiding the draft and hiding and then affecting kids' lives miserably for 35 years is probably not the best choice, I don't want to judge, but also like med school, obviously, you know, if you're in med school or not. I mean, maybe they get drafted to be a medic. Um, I've had two former students who went to med school and then enlisted as officers because it paid for med school and then had obligations to the Navy or to the Army. Did you know that was an angle? I also have a good friend who went to law school, became a lawyer, and then became a lawyer called a JAG in the military because they paid for law school. So, you know, sometimes like if you take up that military thing, they'll fund, it's like VISTA or teaching, it's like teaching in AmeriCorps, like they'll pay for your grad school for teaching if you go teach inner city through this program. And plus you get the experience. And we've sent some JE kids to do that too, okay? So in World War I, Charles Schenck told people, burn your draft card and he got arrested and he got a lawyer. And what did he argue? He argued it was what constitutional right of him to tell people that they should burn their draft card, that this war is improper. First Amendment. First Amendment. What do you think the court ruled? In favor of Charles Schenck or in favor of the United States? The United, United States. States. The United States. And they said, I'm gonna write it down for you. They said, and this is the name of a novel in a movie, they yeah. said that Schenck represented, ready for this, a clear, and this is the ruling of the court's majority decision, present danger.
because he was a danger to the war effort for the United States, to his own country. And that was grounds that your First Amendment rights in wartime are limited in war. That's what the Supreme Court said in this decision, are limited. And they used a very famous example, and I'm going to use a metaphor, an analogy that is probably, I, this is not an encouragement, this is a horrible thing to say. And honestly, I don't think I could get the words out of my mouth without Mr. Depot tackling me. But if I was on the opening night of the musical, to think it would be funny to yell, even though I knew it wasn't true, just to see what happens when we have 900 people in the auditorium, to yell, there's a gunman in the hall, or fire, fire, fire. What would happen if Panic. somebody yelled that? People would what? Panic. Panic and freak out. What if someone got hurt? What if someone, heaven forbid, like a child got trampled and died and like everybody trying to flood the exits? Supposedly would I be responsible because yes. I lied? If they could prove that I made it up, I think I'd get a, a murder charge. At the very least, I'd get voluntary manslaughter. And deservedly so. Because you can't shout fire in a crowded theater is the example the court used about Shank. So that's what they said about Shank. They said that he was, if it's likened to shouting fire in a crowded theater, he's causing chaos through his burn the draft card rhetoric. Now, personally, give a little commentary, that Republicans and Democrats would probably agree, 103 years later, I don't like this decision because if we can't criticize our government, like where are we? It's not like he was causing a riot. He was just telling people to burn their draft cards. But they didn't want this anti-war effort. They wanted everybody to be on board. Vietnam would be so much different, right? Vietnam would be all anti-war effort. Burn and draft cards was a regular occurrence, right? Totally different vibe. Times changed. But in World War I, Charles Shank, the court said First Amendment's limited. Last two things today, and then I'm going to let you on your own. African Americans in the war, 400,000 fought. They fought in segregated units. What's that mean? Blacks fought segregated. They separate fought with lines. other, what? They, separate, they, from separate from other races. So they fought in their own troops. That would happen in World War II as well. It wouldn't be till 1947, 48, 49 that President Harry Truman desegregated the military, really the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. So think about that. They, were, they fought bravely, but they fought separately. What about women during the war? Well, women during the war uh, uh, had a tremendous effect because they filled all these responsibilities of men. They worked for wages. They worked in factories. They filled different jobs. And it helped really lead to the 19th Amendment because women really earned, in the minds of these men in the patriarchy, they had earned this step through their efforts in the war. Now, when we think of where African Americans live, before World War I, the South, right? The South. But today, think about places like, what is the black population in places like Chicago, Detroit, Washington, D.C., Baltimore? Large. Large. Even Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo. That happened from 1910 to 1930. That's known as the Great Migration of African Americans out of the South looking for jobs to the rest of the country, okay? and into urban areas looking for jobs. That's why cities become large African-American populations. One last effect of the war on society, Mexican-Americans cross the border for jobs, and that will be a thing for the next 100 years. Mexican-Americans looking for jobs, crossing over in the Southwest, because jobs were available because of the war. Okay, I'm gonna stop this now.